Jimmy, I'm really starting to like you. Developed by Rockstar Vancouver and released for the PlayStation 2 in October of 2006, Bully is, in simple terms, a third-person open-world action-adventure title. But the beautiful simplicity of Bully is what makes this game so universally relatable. It's not an overly complex, labyrinthian web of plot twists. It's about being a kid in a mad world. And we've all been there. The tale opens with primary protagonist, Jimmy Hopkins, as he lays across the backseat of a car, being driven through the fictional town of Bullworth, arguing with his mother and her husband, her fifth husband. Although Jimmy, his mom, and her beau have a tense, keyed-up argument along the way, it's when Jimmy is finally out of the car that he reveals his true feelings. Mom, why'd you marry that phony? What is wrong with you? Oh, I can't believe this. It's in this moment that he shows his true self, a 15-year-old boy that just wants his mom to make better choices. Jimmy has been expelled from seven previous schools, leaving him with Bullworth Academy, a boarding school set in the New England region of the United States, specifically New Hampshire, as it's implied. The main schoolhouse, where most of Jimmy's classes are held, is a gorgeous, neo-Gothic structure modeled on the Loire Chateau campus of Fetty's College in Edinburgh, Scotland. It's here that we are introduced to Dr. Ralph Crabblesnitch, the head of Bullworth Academy. Our first meeting with Dr. Crabblesnitch sees him grandiloquently issue a stipulation to young Jimmy, demanding that he behave himself while a part of this school, or as he puts it, And boy, remember, you will have a clean nose, so keep it clean, or we'll clean it for you. Though it's clear that he's a bit of an ignorant, magisterial jerk that doesn't really care for the child before him, I wouldn't qualify Crabblesnitch as the game's primary villain. It's really the character of Gary Smith that becomes his ultimate foe. Sent me insane. That's fascinating. Now if you'll excuse me. I said me. relax, friend. Get off, man. Listen to me, tough guy. You just arrived at the toughest school in the country, and I'm offering to be your friend. Trust me, in a place like this, you're gonna need friends. Gary Smith is, in essence, a master manipulator in training. He sees the new kid at school as yet another agent to stir chaos and disorder in Bullworth Academy. When enough bedlam has been perpetuated, Gary Smith sees himself as being able to capitalize on the madness by endearing himself to Dr. Crabblesnitch as the head boy that will reign in the mayhem. Why don't you guys leave the thinking up to me? What? 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 What the? Can't you say anything else? <laughs> you know what, Petey? You were right. Jimmy is pretty dumb. What'd you say about me? Whoa, nothing, no, no, no. All I said was that you had to be pretty dumb to get expelled from so many schools, that's all. <laughs> the other of Jimmy's cohort early in the game is Pete Kowalski, the small, timid kid that basically accepts his role as a doormat as long as he can have some human contact. Little Petey is a lovely counterpart to Gary Smith, and I've always found this dynamic between Gary, Jimmy, and Pete very fascinating, and in my opinion, Gary and Pete are a bit symbolic of Jimmy's inner personality turmoil. According to famous and controversial Austrian neurologist Sigmund Freud, the personality is composed of three major components, the id, the ego, and the superego. Gary Smith represents Jimmy's id, the part of himself driven solely by the pleasure principle, which is stated almost exactly to this point at the end of the game, when Jimmy confronts Gary about why he did what he did. Gary is shown being highly anxious, on edge, and demanding urgent action to seek gratification as quickly as possible, which is perhaps how Jimmy behaved in the years of his consistent expulsion from multiple schools. On the other side, Petey represents Jimmy's superego, a character that sees the unacceptable behaviors from the outside and wishes that some semblance of ideal standards could be held by all around him. He has the strongest sense of right and wrong. 
It doesn't mean that Pete is perfect, it's that he's latched himself to Gary, the id, out of sheer desperation for companionship. Think. Whatever, Jimmy. You know, I stand up for you and you still think I'm a dork. You're a jerk. And you're a dork, so we're equal. Whatever. I'm leaving. Jimmy is the game's ego, caught between the superego, where he knows idealistically what is right and wrong, and the id, those old destructive urges that have failed him many times before. In Freud's theory, the ego helps keep you grounded, preventing you from slipping back into primal impulses, or id, but it also prevents you from becoming too quixotic as to stray from reality. And Jimmy Hopkins is one of the most pragmatic characters that Rockstar has ever written. He doesn't necessarily want to get involved, but once he's mixed with the various cliques, he can't help himself but try to fix the problems he sees cropping up around him. When Gary Smith feels like he can't bend Jimmy to his malicious will, he attempts to have the biggest bully in school, Russell, beat Jimmy to a pulp by implying that Jimmy has been spreading rumors about Russell's mom and a few farm animals. Russell, go beat that little jerk who said that nasty stuff to me about your mom and those barnyard uh, animals. What? After this is unsuccessful, Jimmy befriends Russell, and the cowardly Gary Smith retreats into the background for most of the remainder of the story, scheming a new plan. Also, Jimmy Hopkins swings both ways. Did you remember that? Yeah, you can kiss at least three male characters that I found in the game for a health boost, same as you do with the ladies. I had almost forgotten that when I played this game for the review. Not because it's unimportant, but because it wasn't meant to be a big deal. It was just Jimmy. He happens to like dudes, too, and nobody really cared. Unlike in modern times, it wasn't force-fed to an audience thought too dumb and ignorant to understand that premise. It was just an organic element to the game, as it is in life. Wait, didn't I say this was simple? God damn, I stink! Alright, ignoring the amateur psychoanalysis, the story of Bully is wonderful. After the early game, and not again until later in the tale, Pete and Gary mostly bugger off. As a matter of fact, you'd be completely forgiven if you forgot about Gary Smith entirely until Pete reminds Jimmy, and thus the audience, that he's still out there plotting. But the rest of the cast fills out the story layers in between very well. The tale of Bully, especially compared to Rockstar Games' usual steely plots, is a light-hearted story where Jimmy progressively interacts with the people around him, notably the clicks in the game. Feeding time at the zoo. Okay, here's the deal. Over there we got the nerds. Of course, they're complete social outcasts. They look pretty harmless. They're actually sneaky bastards. Their turf is the library. And those are the preps. They're all money and condescending attitudes. Yeah, massively inbred and completely brainless. Very observant, Jimmy boy. Now over there are the greasers. They think they're tough. Or at least try to look tough. Wouldn't advise messing with them. At least not yet. They hang by the auto shop. And last but not least, the jocks. These guys rule the school. Definitely avoid them. Whatever, I'm not afraid of some dumb roid monkeys. You'll learn. Come on, let's go. These factions include the jocks, the nerds, the preppies, the greasers, the townies, and of course, the bullies. Each clique has its own unique leader and are based off the sort of classic stereotypes that many of us grew up with. Each group has a unique battle theme, fighting style, and they dress alike. And hey, Stereotypes come from somewhere, and I definitely knew a few Biffs, Algernons, and even had a creepy Mr. Burton-type gym teacher in high school. In fact, I'll make it clear that I never saw you coming out of an adult store clutching illicit magazines. Good boy! Headed by Ted Thompson, the jocks are atop the hierarchy of school cliques, and the last of which Jimmy takes on. They mostly hang out around the football field and the gymnasium, and are easily identifiable by their varsity jackets or Bullworth athletic wear. They're the classic meathead archetype seen in so many 80s movies, and they're always fun to battle. The bullies, notably dressed in white button-up Bullworth dress shirts, are, for me, the least interesting click in the game. 
Russell, their leader, is a very memorable and notable character, especially late in the story. Jimmy, there you are. I don't know what to do, and I smell like me. But the remainder of the group are pretty forgettable. They mostly just hang out in town and around campus, picking on everyone, as their name would imply. On the other hand, the preppies are probably the best click in the game. I almost said the nerds were the best because I am one. But the preppies are hilariously snobbish, with their members being rich elitists that speak in this pretentious, faux English accent. They dress in posh clothing and come from a long line of old money and inbreeding. The missions involving the preps are usually the most entertaining in my opinion, and I love being able to head to the boxing gym to spar a while when the mood strikes. Also, defeating the boxing prep challenge nets Jimmy the Beach House, my personal favorite save point. This sucks. There's never anything good on TV. What? War footage and natural disasters doesn't do it for you? The Preps' sworn enemy, the Greasers, are a faction of 50s throwbacks that wear leather jackets and have slick, coiffed hair that would make Danny Zuko proud. The Greasers are from the New Coventry area of town, real working-class blue-collar kids, hence their rivalry with the snobbish, spoiled Preps. The storyline between their lovesick leader, Johnny Vincent, his girlfriend Lola, and all the boys she's been teasing and manipulating, including Jimmy Hopkins, is simple but entertaining. Located in the poorest part of town, Blue Skies Industrial Park, are the Townies, a ragtag group of teens that consist of dropouts, expelled Bullworth students, and their leader, Edgar, who simply couldn't afford tuition to attend. The townies despise and resent everyone from Bullworth, and thus, up until near the end of the game, they'll attack Jimmy on sight without provocation. Like the bullies, the townies are a group that fall on the less interesting side for me. Exploring Blue Skies is excellent, and the concept of this outcast group does add a wrong side of the tracks feel to the whole area, keeping you on your toes the whole time. But really, they just serve as a plot device for Gary, as this is the faction that he manipulates to turn the whole of Bullworth Academy into a frenzied riot that he can then blame on Jimmy Hopkins. Aside from Zoe, they're kind of lame. Speaking of lame. This is my normal style of rapping, bro. Hoo hoo hoo. Nerd! the nerds, my kindred spirit, the most on-the-nose click in the entire game, the glasses, the hunched shoulders, the Kelly Green Astronomy Club shirts, and Algernon's jorts. Led by their megalomaniacal leader, Ernest, the nerds are often found, of course, in the library as well as Dragon's Wing comics out in the town of Bullworth, where they gather to play grottos and gremlins. Where are they? Whereas with every other faction that Jimmy conquers by beating their leader in fisticuffs, you earn the nerds' respect by beating one of their members, Fatty, in the arcade game Consumo. The nerds in combat are just plain ridiculous. Their primary attack is slapping and shoving you with all the momentum of a glacier. I love them so much, and they remind me of a few friends I had back in the day. Each click in Bully also has another unique feature, ladies. Each group has a gal pal that tags along for the story beats, and they're equally as unique and funny as their male counterparts, sometimes much more so. The nerdy girl, Beatrice, is Jimmy's first love interest. If you can get past her cold sores, she's the first lady that you can receive a kiss from, which grants Jimmy a health boost. I love the classic, quirky, nerdy girl character design, and her awkward personality is very charming and funny during cutscenes. I'm gonna fail chemistry and I'll never get into med school. Now I won't find the cure for cancer. Basically, the future of the whole world rests on those notes. What's her biggest antagonist is Mandy Wiles, the spoiled brat jock cheerleader that torments poor Beatrice for simply being one of the nerds. Later in the game, after lewd pictures of Mandy get plastered around town and she experiences abject embarrassment, Jimmy agrees to help her, and her character has a big, humbling arc. To 
sum it up, this is what I consider to be one of Bully's greatest features, if not the greatest, the characters and the story. As simple as it is, which if you'll recall is something I count as a plus, all the characters are so incredibly charming and highly memorable. They all feel like exaggerated yet very relatable people that you and I could have been friends with back in the day. Or it could have been that one of these archetypes was you before you blossomed, you handsome devils. Rockstar Games have always put out unforgettable characters in their titles, and in particular, have a stellar track record with crafting memorable groups of people, like the various gangs in Manhunt for instance. Though most watching this may know my love for Manhunt, I say without hesitation that the characters in Bully are far and away my favorite from Rockstar Games' entire extensive library of excellent personas that have colored their games over the years. The only character that even comes close is, of course, Brucey Kibitz. Why didn't you tell me it was Nika? Why? Ultimately, the story of Bully isn't a masterpiece. It's pretty much straight out of several coming-of-age films from the 80s and plays things pretty straight. But again I say, the simplicity of the tale is its greatest strength. It's something that nearly anyone who was a kid in high school once can relate to in some way, shape, or fashion. Even if you were nothing like Jimmy, the characters being so colorful, exaggerated, and unique are what sells the premise of Jimmy Hopkins attempting to work his way through the year at Bullworth Academy. The writing is excellent, with plenty of scathing social commentary presented with good humor and charm, as opposed to feeling forced, too pessimistic, or nihilistic. Of course, written dialogue wouldn't mean much without solid performances to back it up. Smash them! Smash them all! Old Bullwoodville's full of them! Please, I'll even pay you! Just make it stop hurting! Then what are we going to do? Beat him back to the ghetto! Yeah! yeah! Look, I know I say this a lot, but I cannot emphasize it enough. Audio design in gaming is critical. It's what separates classics from the unremarkable. A game like Bully is the perfect exemplification of this point. Rockstar Games have always excelled at casting the right people for the role. You've upset your Jerry Rosenthal as Jimmy was an outstanding decision. Suddenly he realizes. Jerry plays Jimmy as a kid, hardened by life experience, but not completely cynical and bitter. The vocal performance has a good dose of that remaining childhood glow, as well as a distinct acerbic wit. Matt Bush plays Pete Kowalski as the meek, frustrated, loving, but honest and caring little dude he is. It's an excellent performance. Gary's taking everything out of context, man. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't lie, Petey. Don't you lie. Because Peter Vock plays Gary Smith, a hyper-anxious, aggressive narcissist. The dismissive, ultra-condescending tone that Peter uses for Gary makes me loathe the character, which is great. He's a villain, and the performance exemplifies this. Do you know what torture it is to be thinking all the time? No, of course you don't. The remainder of the cast do a phenomenal job. Cody Melton plays the baritone, hulking brute Russell perfectly. Jesse Tendler as the nasally pathological egotist Ernest. In sexual matters is natural during puberty, bud. That's why I was having those dreams. Anyway. Cody Rose Lundquist as the bulky, lovable Eunice. Uh, oh my god! Oh How's my god! Oh my god! <laughs> he took my chocolate! Please get it back. And of course, Robert Stanton as the drunken sot, Mr. Galloway whose voice may sound familiar to some of you. I must be a better person. I must be a better person. I must be a better person. Oh, God! I am pathetic! Why my shoes? Plenty of other shoes out there. Why mine? That's right. He was Dennis the Menace's dad. Mother made arrangements. That's it. I don't want any arguments. Witchity, 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 witchity. Hey, Mr. Galloway. Go away! I Everyone plays their characters magnificently, no matter how large or how minor the part is. 
it truly does help to flesh out each character and endear them to the player. Then there's the music. Sean Lee's score for Bully is one of the best original compositions ever created for a video game. There's a truly spectacular blend of neo-funk, acoustic rock, rockabilly, classical music, and several other subgenres that all come together somehow as a cohesive soundscape that perfectly, and I mean perfectly, captures the vibes and energy of childhood uncertainty, mischief, trouble, concentration, and the halls of academia. Each faction described previously also has their own battle soundtrack that kicks in when you square off with them, as does each class and even a few missions, like Edna's date. I'm a particularly large fan of the English class, art class, and lawn mowing tunes. They're rife with beautiful, nearly hypnotic melodies. I've always really appreciated the simple 4-4 bass line that plays in sync with Jimmy's gate cycle as he runs around Bullworth, as well as the seamless uptick in music as the xylophone, vibraphone, glockenspiel or whatever hits when Jimmy hops on a bicycle. The soundtrack is sublime. It just hits me in a deeply nostalgic part of my heart and I never get tired of hearing it. This music makes me want to be a better musician. It's that good. The sound effects are all pretty much on par with any other Rockstar game of this era. The splats of egging houses, the lively carnival ambiance, the rip of wedgies pulled, and the passionate squishing of gay kisses. Do not come. Do not come. I'm gonna come. It's nothing remarkable. But every sound effect complements the remainder of the rich, full, sonic design. And the audio experience goes hand in hand with the charming visuals in Bully. The original PlayStation 2 release of Bully used a customized version of the renderware engine used commonly in various Rockstar titles at the time, such as Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. The graphics were adequate at the time and served the game well. I completed this version a few years ago, and of course it has dated, but it played just fine and is currently available on the PlayStation Network. The updated, enhanced version of Bully, known as the Scholarship Edition, released a year later and utilized the Gamebryo engine. For this review, I played the Scholarship Edition on the Xbox 360, which I think is the superior version of the game. I do own the PC port on Steam, but it's kind of a buggy mess, and in typical Rockstar fashion, they assembled a B team to poop it out and let it lie. Regardless of which version you play, PS2, Wii, 360, PC, just understand that you're not playing Bully to experience cutting edge graphics. Bully is the epitome of art and atmosphere reigning supreme over polygon counts. One thing this game has in spades is boundless charm. Although the engine has to pull some tricks, such as spawning in the character you just saw on campus out in town 10 seconds later, each character is uniquely voiced and modeled and they share a combination of animations that give them life beyond simply walking around. These factors make the characters of Bully much more special than your average open world NPC. Each environment is lovingly arranged, and everywhere Jimmy goes feels like it has several decades of life worn into it. The map is broken up into five major segments with several smaller regions filling in the rest, such as the chemical plant in Blue Skies, Billy Crane's Traveling Carnival, and a few bodies of water with small explorable nooks. The first environment Jimmy has access to is the campus of Bullworth Academy. Although the gorgeous, towering schoolhouse isn't something we see a lot in the States, there's something universally relatable about the campus. 
I've read as much over the years from fans of the game that come from all over the world. I suppose that being a kid at school surrounded by walls, curriculum, and all the expectations that come with it is a broad experience shared by most of us. Jimmy's dorm room is pretty unassuming early in the game. Just a bed, a dresser, and a desk with a notebook to save your game on. Over time, as you progress, you'll notice little mementos of your various escapades lining the walls of the room. By the time you've completed all the missions, side tasks, and collectibles in the game, Jimmy's dorm room is like a little museum for you to reflect on. It's a really cool touch. Across campus grounds, you'll find the boys' dorm, girls' dorm, Harrington House, the library, the observatory, gymnasium, football field and jock clubhouse, the parking lot where the hobo lives behind the bus, and the auto shop. After completing Chapter 1, the front gates of the academy open and the town of Bullworth becomes available. The town is home to various shops, some open for Jimmy to peruse, like shiny bikes and the market. Some are for decoration, but even the locations that can't be accessed, like the movie theater, dental office, and firehouse, feel real, lived in, and a natural part of that town's history and layout. Out near the shore, you can find the carnival. And let me just take a moment to acknowledge how much I love the carnival. Rockstar wanted Bully to give the player the sensation of being a kid again, with all the highs and lows that come with it. For all the madness with Gary and the creepy corrupt teachers and dropout kids trying to jump you whenever you step into the wrong hood, the carnival is sort of this place of pure, distilled joy. It has this atmosphere of a warm, safe, colorful place that you could get lost in for hours. All the classics are here. The shooting gallery, the dunk tank, the test of strength, and strikeout baseball tossing. Additionally, Jimmy can take a ride on the Big Squid, the Big Canyon Railway Coaster, and, if you need a suspended moment of calm, the Ferris Wheel, which, if you ride at night, is absolutely magical. Additionally, this is where Jimmy can access the go-kart races, which maybe don't hold a candle to Mario Kart, but are still a good time. And if you finish all of them, the street races out in town open up, and you can live out your inner Vin Diesel fantasy. that you are a nerd like me, you love Dungeons and Dragons. I'm anything like you, because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> what? Last but not least, Jimmy can wander into the freak show. The freak show. <laughs> the... I don't think about it. At least I get to sit here and talk to random uncaring strangers who are here to look at the freaks. This is also where you can do some degenerate gambling on midget wrestling. I placed a small bet here, but I came up a little short. <laughs> Beyond the town is Bullworth Vale, where the hoity-toity wealthy types live. Gated manors with gardens, paved roads, and a park to have a nice walk in. Down the way is New Coventry. Opened in Chapter 3, this is the working class part of town. In addition to a closed down deli, a Chinese restaurant, and a junkyard, this is where you can find the BMX park, a la Dave Mira's freestyle BMX. 
It's nothing amazing, but as someone who used to be completely obsessed with BMX, I really appreciate the addition. And it's just kind of neat to toy with this spot for a little while. Last but not least, the final area for Jimmy to explore is Blue Skies Industrial Park, a massive chemical plant, factories, docks, a rail yard, and far down the beaten path, you can find Happy Volts Asylum, a home for the mentally unwell. The residential area is a series of small rundown houses and mobile homes, complete with a makeshift tattoo parlor for Jimmy to get some ink. It's not quite as dingy and revolting, but with the asylum and the processing plants, I always get a slight Carcer City vibe out here. No more! No more! I'm half drunk and I'm about to get fired. Fan! There are also some beautiful weather effects, such as rainfall in the springtime and the snow in the winter. You'll even see the AI do things like pop umbrellas overhead in the rain, which adds another immersive visual layer. I completely adore the environments in this game. They're not as huge or expansive as San Andreas but they cut out the large chunks of empty countryside and are instead packed with much more character and environmental storytelling. And I love San Andreas. It's one of the best games ever made. But one graphical feature that Bully has that so few video games have dared to incorporate are seasonal changes. As you progress through the storyline, the time of year will change. This was a brilliant artistic and storytelling decision that truly does keep Bully in a category of its own. It's the little things, like seeing leaves gently wither and fall from campus trees, ghost, pumpkin, bat, and skeleton decorations pop up as Halloween nears, you know, the proper classic paper decorations strung together with twine. This culminates in the legendary Halloween night mission, complete with everyone wearing costumes, running around, breaking decorative tombstones, and the smashing of pumpkins. We then, before you know it, snowflakes begin to tumble freely from the sky, and winter has arrived. NPCs will don hats, coats, and gloves. The gentle cold breeze blows through, and the light decorations begin to pop up in the trees around Bullworth. It's such a beautiful shift in atmosphere and tone. As time passes, Christmas decorations are strewn about campus, and a thick blanket of snow covers the ground. This leads to the morning of Christmas itself, where Jimmy receives a bad Christmas sweater in the mail from his mom. At least she thought of him, I suppose. In the scholarship edition of Bully, extra Christmas missions were added. They're not all that great, to be honest, but destroying a holiday display in the center of town while Santa's little helpers attack you is pretty amusing and a bit of fun. As quickly as it fell, the snow thaws and the green bloom of spring in Bullworth is upon you. The gorgeous, lush foliage and the flower petals begin to fill the screen and the warmth returns. Essentially, the gameplay of Bully is, for better and for worse, a more light-hearted version of Grand Theft Auto. As previously explained, the map is a pared-down open world, much like GTA, and the mission structure is quite similar. Story missions, of course, progress the plot, and there are several side tasks to complete, and collectibles to collect. Being that the premise centers around Jimmy Hopkins attending a new school, you can go to class. Marked on the minimap as an orange bell, Jimmy can attend up to two classes per day, one in the morning and one in the early afternoon. Each class has five courses to complete that progress and challenge as you go along. 
it's not mandatory to finish them all, but most of them net you some fairly useful bonuses for completing them, like conversational bonuses, extra health from kissing, or faster BMX bikes for Jimmy to ride. Chemistry class is a basic quick time event. You just press the buttons and that's that. It's lame, but you get some new weapons and bonuses to your dorm room chemistry set. English class is one that I personally enjoyed. Though simple, the Anagram minigame is a bit of a brain tease, and the soundtrack for this class is phenomenal. I also like how Mr. Galloway will call you out for being saucy. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't allow that. Gym class is split in two. For one session, you can practice wrestling, where Jimmy can learn useful new moves to use in combat while listening to the hilarious dialogue from Mr. Burton. Hopkins, I was wrong about you. Maybe you really are a really strong girl. The other gym class is Dodgeball, which is a decent little minigame, but it doesn't really give you much. It's okay. The art class minigame reminds me of an obscure Windows 2000 flash game, Moboid. You move about the frame of a canvas as a little paintbrush needing to dive in and fill out as much canvas as possible while avoiding the floating scissors and the erasers. It's a cute, fun, charming little minigame, and again, the music is serene. Though very simple and almost impossible to fail, I really enjoy photography class. By completing successive lessons, Jimmy gains access to not only the film camera, but the digital camera for color photographs and the yearbook, an extra task for you to complete by taking photos of your classmates around campus and around town. It really adds to that special, unique character design that I had mentioned earlier. One class I genuinely despise is shop. Not only is it as boring of a minigame as chemistry, but if you're a split second late with the left stick QTE prompt, you'll fail the sequence. For a game crafted with such love and care, this course is shockingly bad. The thing is, you unlock faster and better BMX bikes with this class, so it's definitely worth the hassle. And it is a hassle. So, those are all the classes from the original version of Bully, but the Scholarship Edition adds new classes with their own unique rewards. The thing is, they all kind of suck. I do like how completing Geography class grants Jimmy the locations of all the rubber bands on the map, of which the full collection rewards you with the Super Bowl. I'm always happy to relearn a few things that I was extremely rusty in, but the class itself is not too thrilling. In biology, Jimmy is to dissect small creatures and extract their organs. Visually, it's mildly fascinating, but my goodness, the minigame is lame, and you only unlock a series of feeble costume options for Jimmy. Woo. Another period I was exceedingly disappointed by is music. I could not believe that this was the best they could come up with. I get that Jimmy is supposed to be clunky and sound bad, that's the joke, but the tempo of the song doesn't match the prompts and it's really annoying. Also, again, you only unlock a series of gauche clothing options. Boo. Boo! I hope everyone's ready to learn something. This isn't English class, you know. Mathematics is quite possibly one of the finest exercises for the human brain, like squats for the mind. But math and bully stinks! If you fail a certain number of classes, Jimmy gets very special headwear. After finishing all the classes, however, Jimmy has the honor of rocking a snazzy graduation cap. Goes with everything. So the classes are pretty simple and most of them are kind of crappy but I just can't help but complete them every time I replay this game. Maybe it taps into some kind of undiagnosed condition. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, the classes take place in the morning and the afternoon, but the clock on screen isn't just for school. As day transitions into night, you'll have a window of opportunity to play around after sunset, with some missions only being available after dark even. But if you stay out too late, Jimmy becomes tired. Between 1 and 2 a.m., the music will slow, 
and the visuals get a groggy flaccus visual filter as Jimmy's posture slumps and he nears the point of fainting. Get him to a bed for sleep or he'll pass out on the spot. Time management is a small learning curve in Bully, and the day-night cycle adds a certain flow to the game. Some dislike it, some really enjoy it. I appreciate its inclusion as a unique mechanic, but I could take it or leave it. The rest of the mission structure follows a similar design to that of Grand Theft Auto. Strange and colorful characters need help with all manner of tasks, and our leading boy is there to lend a hand. It's standard Rockstar fare, but if it's not broken, don't fix it. This looks useful. And again, the simplicity of Bully's design is a good thing. Missions range from retrieving a diary for a girl, smashing garden gnomes because they make a little person angry, procuring meat, pants, and razors for the gnarly lunch lady's mustache, then gathering items for her date with the biology teacher, this includes sedatives. And some sedatives. And for the sedatives, don't buy them. Just look for them in the trash. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can do that. Then, while they're on the date, you protect the two lovebirds from onlookers and hecklers trying to disrupt the romance. One of my favorites in the entire game is helping a few nerds escape a Scooby-Doo-esque funhouse while protecting them from their pursuers with animatronics. Another highlight is helping to preserve the job of a struggling alcoholic teacher by retrieving his hidden bottles scattered across campus. Thanks to Jimmy, he can drink and keep his job. Then, later, you get to break the same teacher out of an asylum after he's been committed for his ongoing alcoholism. Good job, douchebag. I mentioned it earlier, but my favorite mission has to be the big prank on Halloween night. It's just so cool to be able to run around causing mischief in costume. This mission concludes with Jimmy and Gary placing a flaming bag of feces outside of the teacher's lounge. Who the hell is it? What do you want? Don't put it out with your boots, Tad. <laughs> Poop again! I'll get your damn kids for this! You're all gonna die! I suppose it would have been a better mission had it expanded into the surrounding town. I mean, think of the madness you could have caused, but that's okay. I still have a lot of love for Halloween night at Bullworth Academy. Story missions in Bully are really a page turner. The actual gameplay and mission breakdowns are quite easy and straightforward, but they're mostly short and easily digestible encouraging you to keep completing them. And similar to Grand Theft Auto 4, because they are so well written and acted, the cutscenes truly do feel like a reward for playing the game. Some of the missions, however, are really, really bad and should have been cut. Like the one where you need to steal a bike for this trashy guy in blue skies. You have to bike jack someone, run from the law for a while, and then park it in his garage. Who is this guy? How does Jimmy know him? And why is Jimmy risking juvenile detention and expulsion from Bullworth Academy for him? Oh, and you have to do this several times in the mission. It's terrible. Another stinker, Jimmy is tasked with riding around on this slow, stiff, wicked witch bike while smashing mailboxes. The controls are spotty, and the premise is just boring. Thankfully, the outright bad missions are few and far between. I guess they can't all be winners. Jimmy can also help NPCs with errands, and these are kind of a prototype of the random world events that would later be expanded in Red Dead Redemption, wherein a character will run up to you asking for help. Errands and Bully range from simple tasks, like running a package to a location, or gallantly escorting a lady back to her dorm room on a chilly autumn night. You can even help a hobo find his lost pills. Thanks for the help, kid! To earn money, Jimmy can work various jobs around town, like cutting the grass. Another side job is the paper route. This is basically just Paperboy 3D, but it's a fun little distraction and doesn't overstay its welcome. 
And as usual, the score is phenomenal with its groovy urgency. The side jobs aren't incredible or anything, but I never felt burdened by them, and they're oddly relaxing sometimes. Throughout the game, Jimmy can unlock new save locations across the map by completing challenges against each faction. This is very useful for when you're out in town late and need to find a bed quickly. And can I just say how much I enjoy earning the beachside clubhouse? Aside from lacking a garden, the beach house is a smashing waterside villa nestled right next to a lighthouse. As silly as it may sound, this is kind of peak gaming comfort for me. Along with the calm, soft taverns of oblivion, there's something inexplicably serene about this clubhouse. Perhaps it's the bar, arcade cabinet, tacky bearskin rug, and stuffed swordfish mounted to the wall, all to the jazzy lounge music in the background. It's oddly pleasant. Does it do it for you? Nice place you guys have found. I think I'll take it. What do you want, Hopkins? I want you gone. Get lost. However, aside from the nerd challenge, Jimmy procures these clubhouses by just beating the crap out of everyone in it. <laughs> he just comes off as a massive ruffian and a bit of a lunatic, frankly. But hey, at least Jimmy can fight. Bully has a pretty extensive list of hand-to-hand -hand moves. It reminds me a bit of the fighting system from the absolutely phenomenal game The Warriors, released by Rockstar a year prior. Jimmy can lock onto targets where he can then throw hooks, uppercuts, sidekicks, roundhouse kicks, overhand punches, and he can grapple, perform takedowns, and do a little ground and pound for good measure. Each faction of the game has their own unique fighting style, so learning these moves and employing them based on your opponent really adds a nice layer to the combat. Because Jimmy fights a lot and cannot use firearms, it was important that Rockstar Vancouver really nail this aspect of the game. And they did! In addition to learning moves in gym class wrestling, like I had mentioned earlier, Jimmy can learn up to six new moves every time he brings a transistor radio to the hobo living behind the bus near the auto shop. Definitely get these as quickly as you can. They make a lot of the fights later in the game much, much more manageable, and stringing together combos is actually really satisfying. On top of the street brawl type fighting, there's a pretty fun boxing game at the preppy club in town. It's a bit more like punch out than fight night, but there's enough strategy to keep it interesting, and landing a knockout blow is always awesome. Although, it must be said, fist fighting from bikes is complete garbage. This is no road rash, it's terrible. But fists aren't young Hopkins' only weapon. Early in the game, Jimmy acquires the slingshot. It's pretty straightforward, but it is powerful if you land a shot, and the missions centered around the use of the slingshot are pretty good. Jim can also unlock the bottle rocket launcher when he acquires the nerd clubhouse in the basement of the comic shop. I rarely use this one, as it doesn't do a whole lot unless you make direct contact. But a weapon that is handy is the spud cannon. You don't get very much ammo for it, but it's a powerful launcher for clearing out some of the bulkier enemies. And on the AI in general, it's fairly basic, but totally effective for this game. And actually quite impressive considering that it ran on hardware released nearly 25 years ago. Next to the mini-map, opposite of your health meter, is the trouble meter. If you commit low-level offenses like not following dress code, you'll essentially be taunted by authority figures. If you're late for class or out past curfew, adults will attempt to catch you and send you to class or back to your dorm. Small crimes can be apologized for if you've passed enough English classes and you'll be let off with a warning. However, if you commit violence against an adult, a girl, or a smaller kid, it's full red bars and the authorities will gang up to actively pursue you. And when they do, there's no apologizing. You're busted. 
The cool thing about this system is, is that it applies to every other child at Bullworth as well. If you're getting attacked by another kid near a prefect or a police officer, they'll step in to help break it up. This is particularly useful during missions where Jimmy is getting interrupted by the hostile AI. See, in Bully, there's a sort of faction respect system. The only problem is, is that it's entirely useless. This is not Fallout New Vegas, where you can perform missions for certain factions and gain their favor or pit sides against one another. As you progress through the story, you sort of arbitrarily lose or gain respect with factions, depending on what happened in the storyline at that time. You really have no control over it. So if you're running an errand and the greasers just happen to dislike you at that time in the story, they'll just start beating you up. They really should have been coded to kind of give you some more space while on a mission, but alas, you could be under a time limit and somebody will just run up on you and start swinging Otherwise, the AI doesn't do advanced tasks like they would in future Rockstar titles. Nobody is pounding railroad spikes or preparing food or anything like that. They just sort of wander around. But because the characters are so colorful and unique, because they have ongoing dialogue with others and oftentimes with themselves, and that they react to the goings on around them, the town of Bullworth still feels very lively. That and the audio-visual ambiance does well to sell the illusion. Also, is that... There are so many other things to discuss about Bully. So many little things. Sliding down rails, making snowballs, starting food fights in the cafeteria, planting firecrackers in toilets, breaking into lockers, swimming out to a semi-sunken pirate ship, egging houses, and playing a few silly arcade games to pass the time. Although Bully sold over 1.5 million copies on the PS2 alone, not counting the Scholarship Edition or the Anniversary Edition, the sequel seems like it will never see the light of day. Talk of the cancelled sequel comes up from time to time, and some legitimate artwork has been leaked, as well as an interview with an anonymous Rockstar employee that confirmed that there was a roughly 8 hour vertical slice of playable content that had been developed. The game supposedly would have picked up the summer following the end of the first game. However, every year, the possibility of a Bully 2 gets colder and colder. There are so many die-hard, happy fans of the original game, myself included, that would give so much to see this realized. But sadly, it looks like we may just have to accept that this is never going to happen. People talk about how Bully 2 could have taken place in a college, but what would have been the point of that? A grittier, harder bully? We've become obsessed with gritty and realistic. There was a shift in Western cultural zeitgeist in the early 2000s. Even heroes like 007 were painted with the gritty brush when Casino Royale released in 2006, the same year as Bully, by the way. But compared to now, 2006 seems kinda tame. Happy endings seem more fantastical and unexpected than ever in this era of pessimism. I suppose my point is, as a bit of a pessimist myself, when I go back and play through Bully again, I experience this odd, bittersweet emotion. At the end of the story, Jimmy saves the school and gets the girl. Everyone is cheering and united as friends, in peace. It's funny, it seems almost antithetical to now. I suppose that comes from playing this game at a time when I used to think that this is how life worked. Playing through Bully again. It's like dreaming of childhood. <laughs>